Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to church. As always, it's just wonderful to be here with each and every one of you this morning. You know, it's a significant day in the life of our church. Our Thornley campus launches today, and it's incredibly exciting. We praise God for that. It's a a new season, a new chapter for us. And so with that in mind, I, I honestly can't think of a more fitting passage for us to look at than the faithfulness of God. You look at the history of this place, and I think it's fair to say that you can see the tangible evidence of God's faithfulness. For 60 years, God has placed his favor on this church. Now, we really are a blessed people, but can I be real with you? It's so easy to take that favor, that covering for granted. Very, very easy. It's something that human beings fall into again and again. And even as I look at my own life, I'm ashamed to say that there have been times where I have absolutely taken God's grace for granted. And it's tough because we don't want to fall into legalism. That I know the love that God has for me is completely independent of my good works, my faithfulness. And yet, faithfulness matters. The life that I live matters. It's so easy to move that pendulum too far the other way and to abuse God's grace. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, directly before the passage we're looking at today, he says, I do not run like somebody raining, running sorry, aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I've preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. God's grace covers over all. Romans 8.1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. And yet the way that we live our lives matters. That's what we're gonna be looking at this morning. So why don't you open up your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 so we have a look at the first 13 verses together. If you don't have your Bibles here this morning, it's gonna be up on the screen for you as well. So here we go, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse one. It says, for I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them, and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. And we should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test Christ as some of them did and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as a warning for us on whom the culmination of the age has come. That just means post-Jesus. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you do not fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And, and that word is actually the same word as but, so but God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. So we pick it up in verse one and Paul is having, if we're honest, just a slight dig at the Corinthian church. It's almost like a backhanded compliment, which is really the best kind of compliment in my opinion. If my wife was here, she'd just be shaking her head. She disagrees with me vehemently, but that's kind of what it is. And he says, I don't want you to be ignorant. It's really just a nice way of saying you're ignorant. <laughs> and it sounds harsh, I know, but Paul loves them enough to be honest. That's what this is, Paul loves them enough to be honest. So he knew that as gifted as they were as a church, and everything you read in here would show you they're an incredibly gifted church. 
The Spirit was moving in powerful ways. You'd see things, tongues, prophecy, all this kind of stuff. As gifted as they were as a church, as blessed as they were, they were actually in danger. And he just wasn't willing to sweep that under the rug and pretend like everything was okay. It wasn't. So he says, I don't want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that all of our ancestors were under the cloud and that all of them passed through the sea. Now, the word that I want you to circle there is all, believe it or not. Not a particularly spectacular word. But there's a progression in this passage. In verses one through four, he says, all of them experienced this and this, all of them. And then we get to verse five and he says, but God was not pleased with most of them. The next step in the progression. And then he goes on to explain in the following verses why that is. He says, some of them did this and and some of them did this, so on and so forth. And then that progression culminates at the end of the passage as Paul narrows his focus in on you. Because this passage isn't just a history lesson. It was written for you. That you might know the faithfulness of God in the midst of temptation. That you might stand and not fall. That's why it was written. So what did all of our ancestors experience? Well, the short answer is they experienced the blessing and favor of God. That's what you see in those first four verses. God was with them in a real and in a tangible way that he did incredible things for them. So Paul lists some of that. He says, remember the cloud. And you guys would probably know the story. The people of Israel are making their way to the promised land. They're moving in this enormous column because there's like a million of them. And at the head of that column is this pillar of cloud. It was a pillar of cloud by day. It was actually a pillar of fire by night. But everywhere they went, that cloud was there. And it was a constant reminder of the people of Israel, but also to the nations around them that Yahweh is here. He doesn't abandon us. No, he goes before us. God led his people through the wilderness. He literally went before them. The only time that we see that cloud move from the head of the column It's when the Egyptians come up behind them. And then we see that pillar of cloud move from the head to the back so that God might stand watch over his people. He literally stands in between his people and the Egyptians. But that's the only time we see that pillar of cloud move. I think everybody would acknowledge that's the favor of God. That as a people, they experience divine blessing and privilege and favor from God. He led them, he protected them. And Paul says, all of our ancestors experienced that. They saw it with their own eyes. And it wasn't just that. He says, remember how our ancestors passed through the sea. Remember the story of Exodus. They were slaves in Egypt, but as God parted that water, he took them out of slavery and into the promises and the plans that he had for them. And he took a group of nobodies and turned them into a holy nation set apart for his purposes. In a sense, he redeemed them. Well, that's the grace and mercy of God, the favor of God. And there's more, it goes on. He says he provided for them. That every morning manna would literally fall from the sky. It's a type of bread. So the people could walk around and gather what they needed for the day. Food fell from the sky. There's a movie about that. <laughs> Second one's not very good. But still, this happened in the Bible. Food fell from the sky. You don't have to go looking for it, it just fell and then they'd wander around, pick up what they needed to go back. And then there's the spiritual drink. In Jewish, Jewish tradition, it says that Moses carried around this special rock. And that, that rock is what gave water to the people everywhere they went. Now, Paul reinterprets that and says, actually, you missed the point. Moses wasn't carrying around some kind of magical rock, that was Christ. 
pre-incarnate Jesus was there with his people, providing for them, making sure they never went without. You read through Exodus and Numbers and you see God do miracle after miracle. He was faithful and kind and good to all of them. In other words, God did his bit. He held up his end of the bargain. And yet, verse five says that most of them took that for granted. They abused that grace, that favor, and so most of them died in the wilderness. They were what Paul feared being in 1 Corinthians chapter nine, disqualified. That word is adokamos. It means to be unfit for, unapproved, no longer useful. And I wanna be really clear, Paul isn't talking about his salvation, he's talking about his ministry. That I beat my body, I make it my slave so that I might not be unapproved, unfit for the ministry of the gospel. And here's why that's important. These two passages are linked. Everybody agrees that chapter 10 is an unpacking of the end of chapter nine. So if Paul is talking about salvation in chapter nine, then he's saying that most of them died cut off from the Lord, including Moses. And that's where it gets a bit tricky. Because I don't know about you, but there's not a single part of me that doesn't think that Moses isn't standing in the presence of God right now. That just doesn't add up. Moses' disobedience didn't cost him his salvation, but it's not to say it wasn't costly. God had been so good to them. He covered them in favor and privilege, but in the end, he removed that from all of them but Joshua and Caleb. Well, they were the only ones to see the promised land. The only ones who saw that promise come to fruition. And the point that Paul is making is don't let that be you. Verse six says, these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. That's why they lost divine favor and privilege. They gave their hearts to the wrong things. And Paul is saying, don't let that be you. You know, the word there for evil things really just means worldliness. They chased after the things of this world. That's why they fell short of the promised land. Because somewhere along the way, their hearts craved, they valued the things of the world more than God. And after everything that we just read, after all the things that we'd seen that God had done with them, you'd be excused into thinking, how? How could you see God do all of that? How could you experience that much of his goodness and still find yourself wandering? It's a genuine question. I think it says something about the human heart. And just look at some of the examples that Paul gives. In verse seven, he says, do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. Now it's a reference to Exodus 32. Moses is up on Mount Sinai getting the Ten Commandments so that God can teach them what it means to live in covenantal relationship. And while he's up there chiseling away, people get bored. And so they make an idol, a golden calf. And we read that and we think, what? What are you doing? God had just parted the Red Sea. There's a pillar of cloud and fire with them everywhere they go. And they're melting down gold so that they can worship a cow. It's a bizarre story. And it's not just that. They're worshiping an idol and that's bad enough. But that word revelry is super deceiving. Some translations say they got up to play, which is weird, innocuous, but a weird thing to say. The NSAB says they indulged in lewd behavior and that gives you a clue. But that word is actually talking about some kind of orgy. So Moses is up on the mountain communing with God and the people are right there at the base of the mountain engaging in some kind of weird cultic orgy. And we read that and we think, what's wrong with these people? 
How, how can you get to that place? But there's more. Verse 8 is a reference to Numbers 25. And you can read the story for yourself. Verse 1 says this. While Israel was staying at Shittim, the men began to indulge in sexual immorality with Moabite women who invited them to sacrifice to their gods. And the people ate the sacrificial meal and bowed down before their gods. So Israel yoked themselves to the Baal of Peor and the Lord's anger burned against them. If you know anything about Baal, Baal worship, you know that it involved child sacrifice. That's the kind of stuff and, and they're yoking themselves to this. Verse nine is a reference to Numbers 21. Once again, you can read it for yourself. But essentially, the people turn on God and they turn on Moses because they hated the desert. And I get it. There's nothing particularly appealing about the desert. We would know. It's what most of this state is, right? But what about all the incredible things that God had given them? Everything that he'd done for them. What about the manna that's literally falling from the sky? where they grumbled and complained constantly. They were so quick to forget about everything that God had done for them, so quick to turn away. And Paul is saying, all of that is the result of a heart that's chasing after the things of this world instead of Christ. That's what he says. We read that and think, how could you be so stupid? I would never do that. And yet here is Paul writing to the church. That's us, to the church in Corinth because he can see them heading down that same road. It started going to pagan festivals, participating in pagan feasts because that's what you, just, that's what you did in Corinth. It was so ingrained into their culture. It was like a social activity. And Paul says in verse 21 of this same chapter, he says, stop. He says, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. That's what he says to them. You can't have both. And you might be sitting there thinking, you know what, thanks for the warning, but I haven't been to any pagan festivals lately. And that might be true. But Paul is just talking about Christians who are living a double life, and I know a whole lot of Christians living a double life. I haven't seen any golden calves lately, but I've seen plenty of Christians who've turned their career into an idol. I've seen Christians who have made family into an idol. And they even have this little order where they say family first and then the church and all this kind of stuff. I've seen Christians who've made sex, money, image, achievement into an idol. And it might look different, but don't think for a second the church doesn't have idols. There's a reason that Paul uses the language of baptism in verse two. It kind of stands out to us as this weird thing that what he's trying to do is he's trying to connect the experience of the people of Israel to our experience. And he wants you to identify with their story. That just like the people of Israel, we've been rescued out of slavery. Just like them, we've been made into a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And we've experienced the favor of God just like they did. And he wants you to know that just like them, we have the capacity to take all of that for granted. We have that capacity. You know, I lived a double life for a number of years. Be out to three or four in the morning, not with street chaplains, doing other stuff. And then I'd be up at six so that I could get to church on time. My mama was scary, so I was there on time every time. And I was in the band, and not that I was actually any good. In fact, true story, the first time I played at church, they didn't plug my amp in. How rude is that? How dare they stand me up there and not even plug me in? It's probably better that way, let's be honest. I was in the band, so I'd be there bright and early at seven o'clock, singing to Jesus, feeling like death. It's some old people in that church, but I felt like I had a head start on some of them. I felt so bad I could almost taste heaven. I promise you, I could almost taste it. I look back at that and I think, man, all of that was pointless. Seriously, it was all just a facade. And I knew that. It didn't mean anything. And ultimately, and here's the kicker, there was no joy there. 
I was living a double life to try to please somebody else, probably try to, to dissuade my own conscience, right? And it was death. Paul says these things happened to them as examples and were written down as a warning for us because he wants you to know it's death. He wants you to know that God has so much more for you than that. So this is how he finishes it in verse 11. He says, these things happened to them as examples and were written down as a warning for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you do not fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. But God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Notice I said it doesn't magically disappear. It says so you can endure it. So how do we not go down that same road? How do we resist the temptation that every one of us faces? Well, the first thing that Paul says is don't be arrogant. If you think you're standing strong, be careful that you do not fall. See, Paul knows that we have a tendency to think, you know what, I'm good, I've got this. And it's actually the most dangerous place that you can find yourself. The second that you start resting in your own faithfulness instead of the faithfulness of God, you're in trouble. The second you leave that place of absolute dependence and in a sense take your eyes off Jesus because you think, I've done this, I've beaten it, I'm good, you're in trouble. Yeah, I hope rests not in our own faithfulness, but in his. And that's why Paul says in verse 13, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. That word is anthropinos. It means bearable for a human being. That's what it literally means, bearable for a human being. And Paul is saying that Jesus is sovereign over everything, including the temptation that you face. And that's a bit of an odd thought, but it's true. He's sovereign even over the temptation you face. He sovereignly watches over you. And he won't allow you to face temptation that you cannot bear. He always provides a way out. And if that wasn't enough, he places his spirit inside of you to lead you out. He's not just sitting back pointing you to the way out. No, he dwells in us. That's how committed he is to leading us out of darkness and into light. Now that's the faithfulness of God. He won't allow you to face anything beyond what a human can bear. And he won't allow you to face anything beyond what you personally can bear. But he knows you. He's not setting you up for failure. No, his heart, more than anything, is to lead you into life. That's the heart of God, to lead you into life. Now, practically, here's what I think that means for you in the midst of temptation we have a tendency to look in here to try really hard to do the right thing. And I think Paul is saying, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. That's the key. He provides the way out. It's not found in here. He provides the way out. He's faithful even when we're not. So getting back to verse six, your job is to love him is to set your heart on him. And we might be broken, a redemptive work in progress, but God is faithful. So get in loving Jesus. Set your heart to pursue him, to worship him, to love him with all that you are. Pursue him. That's the key. And then the wonderful thing is that actually the Spirit of God does what we can't. As we fix our eyes on Jesus, the Spirit does what we cannot do in and of ourselves. So here's how I want to finish this morning. You know, God has blessed this place incredibly. He's been faithful to us for 60 years. 
And here we are on the edge of a brand new season, a brand new chapter for our church. And I think God wants to remind us that 60 years of favor and blessing doesn't mean that we're somehow untouchable. The letters in Revelation make it so clear God can remove the lampstand from a church anytime he wants, because it's his church. He said to the church in Sardis, remember therefore what you have received and heard. It's the gospel, hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what time I will come to you. That's sobering. We are an incredibly blessed church. I mean, just look around this room. Look how many gifted people are in this place. Look at what God has done in and through this place. But that doesn't mean that we can do whatever we want and think that God's blessing and favor is always gonna be there. Truth is that none of this exists without him. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. So we enter this new chapter by looking back and acknowledging the faithfulness of God. That's important. But we also know how important it is to remain in that place of absolute dependence as we step out in faith. It's true for you as a follower of Jesus. It's true for us as a church. These things occurred to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things, the things of the world as they did. So here's how I want to finish. I want to finish by doing exactly that. Right now, I'm just gonna give you some time to meditate on the faithfulness to God, to acknowledge the good things of God in your life, but then I want want you to set your heart on Jesus, to purposefully, prayerfully set your heart on Christ. May we be a people who seek the kingdom of God first, who see him rule and reign in here. So that's what I want you to do right now. I'm just gonna give you a minute or two. Bow your head, just you and the Lord. Acknowledge the faithfulness of God in your life, but then actually invite him into that space. Say, Jesus, show me where my heart is actually wandering. Help me to set my heart on you again. This isn't about earning anything. This isn't about being good enough. The Paul's heart is that we would not miss out on the good things that God has for us. So we thank you, Jesus. We recognize that you are faithful. We see that on the cross, faithfulness of God. perfect sacrifice that took our place, that made a way for us to walk with you, our God and King again. See the faithfulness of God. We acknowledge in our own lives. We are a blessed people, but we also acknowledge Jesus, the tendency for our hearts to wander and to do it so quickly. We have these incredible experiences of you. And then a week or two later, it's like it never happened. And we get distracted by the things around us and we get pulled into the things of this world and 
And, and pretty quickly those experiences, encounters with you just feel distant and we're not even sure, was I making too big of a deal with that? It's just the human heart, the tendency we have Jesus to wander. We say, Jesus, forgive us. Thank you for redeeming us. We can see that your work is in progress. So we've been given life and you've placed your spirit inside of us and yet we recognize that the redeeming work is not finished. And so we still are prone to wander. So we say, Jesus, forgive us. May our hearts be so encapsulated by you, that there's no room for sin, no room for the desires of this world. We pray, Jesus, no one here would be driven by guilt, and nobody here would be driven by just trying harder, but Jesus, that our love for you would result in joyful obedience. And so we pray, Father, reveal yourself to us again. We want to encounter you. We want to know you. Our hearts to be filled with your love. Keep, help us, Jesus, to keep our eyes fixed on you. This we pray for in the precious name of Jesus. And all God's people said,